Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone that's here in the uh, Lamb of God Fellowship Hall. Good morning to Jill and Reverend Art that are zooming in from home. And uh, good morning to you that may be watching this later on on YouTube. We're so glad you've joined us. Uh, this is a time when we will study uh, God's word, particularly God's word was uh, given to us by Ezekiel. But it's also a time to worship and praise him. And so we begin this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we'll begin our time together with uh, him. It's for you. Speak, O Lord, your servant hears. Let's see if I can get this on the screen. Let your word to me come near. Do more life and spirit give me. Let each promise still my fear. Death's red power, its inward strife. Wars against your word of life. Fill me, Lord, with love, strong fervor. And I cling to you. Blessing to be near you and to listen to your voice. Let me ever love and hear you. Let your word be now my choice. Many hearted sinners, Lord, flee in terror at your word. But to all who feel sin's burden, you give one. Lord, your words are waters living when my thirsting spirit leads. Lord, your words are bread life giving. On your words, my spirit feeds. Lord, your words. This hymn has a, has a good apt summary of uh, what we're going to be studying. Many hardened sinners, Lord, flee in terror at your word. It's going to be the law we continue to hear as Ezekiel applies it to uh, the exiles and those that are in Jerusalem. But to all who feel sin's burden, you give words peace and heart. These hard words of the law from the Lord have that aim in everybody. That we would repent and Receive God's grace and pardon through that. Continue on with our time of worship as we read uh, our responsive reading, and it comes from Psalm 147, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is blessed and for the long, for it is 
The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He, he determines the number of stars. He gives to all of them their grace. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is the power of the shield. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, there is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us turn to our Lord and Savior in prayer. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would be near us today. And not just near us, but within us. You've sent your Holy Spirit in our baptism. Spirit, be active in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Help us to wash away the problems of the world and the things that are heavy on our consciousness and our hearts. And attune ourselves to hear your word. Your word spoken, not just for our edification, but for the increase of faith and for the comfort of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we lift up Cheryl, our dear sister, who's not feeling well and has a doctor's appointment today. May she be able to rest and recover, use this doctor appointment to uh, bring her completely back to health. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, come alongside my brother, my Reverend Art. Help him with the paperwork and with all the problems that he's struggling with, with his vision. As he goes through today, give him direction and guidance on what he should work on and when. And Lord, we give thanks for the help that Glenda is willing to give. Lord, in your mercy. Your honor. Lord God, be with all of those among us in our congregation who are sick, who are recovering, who are struggling. Be present in their lives and be there with your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we ask that you would continue to support and strengthen and grow our grief support ministry so that all those who are mourning losses of any kind would be blessed through that by your presence and, and by just the loving presence of one another. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with all of those who are affected by the Oxford shooting trial. In the while well, the publicity from the court case, those that must relive this terrible moment, come alongside them and grant them recovery, grant them strength to cope during this. And Lord, we ask that justice would be done. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with all of those in California who are suffering from the rain and from the what the rain causes, the flooding and the mudsides. Protect people and, and be with those that have lost things homes and everything else and 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 be with them and, and bring bring what they've lost back restore them lord what they've lost lord in your mercy be with jerry and tina nippa lord uh, grant them continued healing and we pray that as soon as possible they would be able to return to worship and to bible study lord in your mercy entering this busy time of year lord be with me grant me direction guidance health and healing Support me, Lord, so that I can be your voice here among these people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we give thanks on behalf of Carol for the healing that you've provided in her foot and that she requires no surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with Mike Bergeron as he goes through chemo treatments to remove the cancer. We ask that that would be successful and he would be restored completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we give thanksgiving for a number of things, for all the blessings that you've given us in our lives, specifically on behalf of Norma, that the vein treatment she had went well, and we pray that it would go well also in her other leg. We give thanks for Greg's healing and recovery from cancer, and we give thanks for the warm weather. We ask that it would continue for as long as you know it needs to. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we lift up our dear sister Carrie and ask that you would continue to recover her from the illness that she's been suffering from stomach flu. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, I'd be with all those who are struggling with mental health issues among us and in this area. Provide support for them and people that can come alongside them and grant them the help that they need, which comes from your hand. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. 
Lord God, be with all of those uh, members and attenders that used to be here but are next, remain absent from worship. Work in their life. If need be, Lord, shake them out of their doldrums by throwing problems in their life and then direct them to turn back to you. When we encounter problems and struggles, this is the place we need to be. In your presence with our brothers and sisters in Christ, hearing your word, work that in their life, Holy Spirit. Direct them back, and when they come back, may we be a welcoming presence and provide no guilt, but just the love that they need. Lord, in your mercy. All of these things we commend over into your care, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people respond. Amen. The Lord be with you. And all of us be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. We lost Reverend Art. Hopefully he'll be back. We are working on... Uh, Chapter 16, Ezekiel 16, and uh, so we can prepare ourselves to answer the questions for day four. Hopefully that'll happen. We did begin last week with reading the first part of chapter four. And if you could think back, clear the cobwebs out of your mind, uh, she wouldn't remember. Uh, the Lord is giving an allegory. It's an allegory of uh, somebody who was born and cast aside. Remember that? A baby born and unwanted cast aside in an open field. And, uh, of course, this baby is Israel. <laughs> so the Lord's using this allegory to kind of remind them, here's where you came from. Here's what I did for you. And so he can move to here's what you did in response. He says, your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. Is that correct? Was Israel's, well, that was Israel's father and mother? No, no. <laughs> The father of Israel was Abraham. He was actually a Semite. He was Chaldean. Came from Chaldea, from Babylon, which is part of the Semite tribe, which works Israel, Semite. But by saying that, is the Lord being gracious or is he making a negative point on them? Negative point. Exactly. Amorites and the Hittites were people that were in the land of Canaan. They were idol worshipers. Uh, they were so bad that God sent Israel in to clear them out, get rid of them and kill them. Yeah, they so, didn't. Right. And the point is now, what is he saying about how bad Israel turned out to be? Worse than the worse. Just as bad and worse. But uh, he uses this allegory to kind of explain what God did for them. So they all came from one man who was not a believer. God raised him up, sent him in. They were prosperous. Had children, famine came, so Jacob took, who was Israel, his other name was Israel. His 12 sons went down to Egypt, and what did they find in Egypt? Sanctuary. Because Joseph was there, he solved the problem of the uh, famine that was going on, gave them a place where they could live separate from the Egyptians, so they wouldn't intermix with the Egyptians, and they were safe. Supposedly, from idol worship, that didn't quite work out. But it's a place where they could grow and thrive and be safe. Excuse me, was that Goshen that they stayed in? I can't. Very good. Oh, okay. The Goshen, the land of Goshen. Okay. And so he talked about. Uh, he passed by and he saw that they were. Uh, uh, he he said, "I I passed by. I saw you kicking about in your own blood. You grew up and developed and became uh, the most beautiful of jewels." And if I picked you up. I put you in this land that supported you. And down there, they became prosperous and beautiful up until the people that were uh, in charge of Egypt, the pharaohs, forgot who Joseph was and saw these people as enemies and started to inflict them. So it goes on to say, I passed by, I saw you. You looked like you were old enough for love. I spread my corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. Remember what that was describing in a very, in this allegory, what would it mean that somebody would walk by and, throw their, their garment over them. Marriage. Yeah. Yeah, it's a symbol in that time of marriage. 
husband claiming this person is his wife is kind of the betrothal period. And uh, he goes on to say, I bathe you with water and wash the blood from you and put ointments on you. And as good Lutherans, when we hear bathe with water and washed off, what does that remind us of? <laughs> baptism and kind of the precursor of baptism, of course, was uh, circumcision. And that takes us back to uh, God saving them out of Egypt. And uh, of course, when they left, what did they leave with? Idols. They left with idols, unfortunately, but they left with riches. Mm -hmm. God, through all of those plagues, had turned Egypt so scared to Egypt so much. It's like, here, please go. And by the way, take these things. And so they walked out of Egypt rich. He brings them to Mount Sinai. He makes them a nation. And he, takes, he uh, brings a covenant to them, which is kind of a marriage contract. Brings them in a covenant, I will be your God, and because I'm your God, you will be my people, and here's how you're supposed to act as my people. That I will be your God, that's grace. They didn't deserve it, but that's God calling the undeserved anyway. And uh, they are to respond. So the Ten Commandments are actually the third use of the law. It's our response to God's grace is how you're supposed to live. And not only that, he goes on to say... Uh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to make you beautiful. I'm going to give you bracelets and a necklace, and I'm going to adorn you with gold and silver. And your food was fine flour, honey, and oil. You became beautiful and rose to be a queen. So, what happened to them when they left Sinai? What happened to them through their wilderness wanderings? What did God do for them? Fed them, provided for them. And how about when they got to the land of Canaan? What did He give them? Food and water. Huh? The land. Everything. Remember how that land God kept describing it? He said it was a land flowing with <laughs> and here he says your food was fine flour, honey, and olive oil. You became a beautiful queen, beautiful and rose to be queen. So what is that describing in Israel's history? Well, the golden age of Israel with King David and the temple and leading up to that. Yep, I gave you the land and, and when I gave it to you. City's already built, vineyards already planted. You didn't have to start from scratch. And even then they were unfaithful, but God raised up a king that would be faithful and you nailed it. Uh, uh, and I'll, uh, that was the biggest. Under David, the kingdom was the biggest it would ever get. Actually, Solomon actually increased it a little bit, but yeah, it covered the whole promise. And they were rich, they were powerful. The other nations around were scared. They made treaties and... Uh, so ideally, then, what should the Lord have done in relation to God for all of these blessings? Just surprised me. Praised him, thanked him, worshipped him. Hang on one second. Hey, brother, what's up? Let's do it. Okay, I got you. You're you're coming in here in just a minute. There you go. You're back. Yep. Anyhow. Yeah, they, they should have they should have worshipped him. They should have been why would why would you go to and worship any other God if he's done all this for you, right? Why do you need Baal and these other gods? Let's look and remember what he's done. Well, they didn't give you all this. It's man's sinful nature, and it's our nature. The more you get, the more. And then it's like, just do whatever you want because things are good. Yep. You, don't, you turn back to God sometimes when things are bad. But when there's a lot of people out there that used to be really good church attenders, and then you know, their life is going merrily along and they don't go to church anymore because they're up at the cabin out golfing and they're doing this and they're doing that and they're living the high life and all of a sudden that comes crashing. Oh, maybe I do need God. Okay. Yeah, why, does, why does God allow those things to happen? Bring them back. Yeah. It's, he allows it to happen. He doesn't send it. He allows Satan and he allows the simple consequences of their own to bite them in the butt. And that's to call them back. And you're right, Faith, you nailed it. Our human sinful condition, and that includes me as well. When things are going, we forget God. We put Jesus on a shelf. We turn to ourselves. We turn to the gods of culture. We do that. It's our cycle because of our sinful nature of sin. 
God bringing us back and us coming back to repentance. It's a cycle that we go through almost daily. That's our life of repentance. I've sinned. I'm forgiven. I've sinned. I'm forgiven. But in repentance, this hurts and this, we love it. And, and that's our life, back and forth. We're kind of almost uh, in a way like uh, bipolar. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But but beyond that, because of God's grace, we're always in his grace. Always. He holds us in his grace. He doesn't look and say, well, faith just sins, so she's out. Okay, now she's back in. No, repentant faith means you remain in, and you know that because he's working that guilt and that conviction in your heart. That's the sign that you are in a covenant relationship with him, that he's working in your heart and mind. God bless him for that. But Israel, going back to them, uh, Ezekiel says, you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. So in this analogy, you've got a woman who was, a, was, was married by a man, given everything, treated like a queen. And what does she do? Unfaithful. Unfaithful. And how do we, how does that cross over into the spiritual realm in Israel? Worshiping idols. Yes. Yes. Worshiping idols is adultery. For the God that's given you everything, you turn your back on. And uh, not only did they worship other gods, also the food I provided for you, the fine flour, the olive oil, the honey, you offered as a fragrant incense before them. So what are they taking? All of the blessings that God gave them, what are they doing with it? Giving them the ones. Yeah, literally giving it as uh, uh, sacrifices for these idols. But also, in a spiritual sense, they're saying, well, the rain comes not from God, but it comes from this Baal dude. So you're taking the wonderful gifts of God and you're saying, no, it comes from something else. How do we do that in our life? How do we take the gracious gifts of God and assign them to somebody else? Look at the wonderful house I have, the nice car I have, a great big family. I am such a great guy. It's because I studied in school and I studied in college and I worked my butt off and I've got this great job. And there's a truth to that to some extent, but who am I making the God of my life? Me. Me. And you can be like that too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Joel. <laughs> yeah. He just wants you to love and you get a nice house and a false nice picket fence. Look at my wife here. She's so beautiful. All right. So easy to pick out him. And then, uh -huh. verse uh, 20, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me and sacrificed them as food for idols. What were they doing with their children? Does it get any lower than that? Because children are a blessing from the Lord, right? That's one of the things he promised them. When you come into this land, if you're faithful to me, You'll throw, you'll become a mighty nation. I'll prosper you. You'll have children that won't be stillborn. I was thinking about, you know, in our lives, we say, well, so-and-so gave 100 bucks. So-and-so gave 500 bucks. But back in that day, it was almost a form of boasting. What are they saying? I gave my kid. I gave my kid. How, how Number up, one donor. How, much, how messed up is that? Good, Al. Good point. How messed up is that? That's, that's sick as you can get. But that, but there was a pride in doing that. There was like, okay, folks, pop that one. We gave her a kid. Do people in our culture take pride in their evil? Yes. They do. That's a sign of real depravity, isn't it? But how you boast in how evil you are. Yes, yeah. Not only that, continuing on verse 23, uh, you built a mound for yourself and made lofty shrines in every public square. So they're worshiping idols, and where are they worshiping it? Right out in public for everybody to see. In this wonderful city that he gave them, Jerusalem, and not just in the city itself. Where else? In the temple. In the temple where it's God alone is supposed to be worshiped. Talk about a slap in the face, and as I mentioned last week, that's kind of like a man bringing his mistress into the house while the wife is still living there. And you're doing it to bring glory to them. Yeah, that everyone will see what they have done. Not only that, increasing your promiscuity to anyone who passed by. You engaged in prostitution with the Egyptians, with the Assyrians, and with Babylon. 
because they looked to these nations to help them. It wasn't just looking to them. They had to give them money to encourage them to help them. And not only that, well, they're a mighty nation. Let's worship their idols. Maybe we'll become a mighty nation too. Hence the idea of idolatry and adultery being synonymous as far as spiritually goes. Questions or comments up till that? So you were saying earlier, God set them apart, put them in a special place in Egypt and made them a special people. Now they're saying, well, we want you to be a part of this. We want you to be a part of this. And they're bringing all that in, this evil, and adding it to their, they're not separate anymore. All right, we'll pick up where we left off, which was uh, Ezekiel 16, and uh, we'll pick it up with uh, verse 30. Uh, somebody read verses 30 through 34. I am filled with fury against you, declares the sovereign Lord. When you do all these things, acting like a brazen prostitute, when you build your mounds at every street corner, made your lofty shrines in every public square, you were unlike prostitute because you scorn payment. You adulterous wife, you perfect stranger, you prefer strangers to your own husband. All prostitutes receive gifts, but you give gifts to all your lovers, driving them to come to you from everywhere from your illicit favorites. So, in your prostitution, you are opposite of others. No one runs after you for you for favors. You are the very opposite for you give payment and none is given to you. Okay. What point is the Lord making in this illustration, looking at the metaphor of an unfaithful wife? She had everything and she's given it away. Not only is she being a prostitute, what do prostitutes normally do? Receive money and she's doing it for free. Just no. come on. Not just doing it for free. She's what? giving it she's giving it away and she's getting nothing in return. Like salvation. She's paying. Yeah. She's paying her jobs. She's paying the men that are prostituting her. They're not paying her. She's paying them. That's the allegory. Cross it over now to the spiritual. What is God accusing Israel of doing? Yeah. Paying new enemies. Right. They're, you're worshiping these false gods. You're going to these nations. You're turning away from me and trusting in them, and you're paying them. And who gave them that thing, those things that they're paying them with? Gifts from the Lord paid to them. And in doing so, they're saying, well, things will be better with, with this nation. They'll protect us. And they're gods. Their gods will protect us. God's point is, did their gods give you any of these things? Did they really do anything? Are you here as a nation because of their gods or these nations? No. Quite the point to make is. Let's continue on with uh, verses 35 to 42. Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whorings with your lovers and with all your abominable idols and because of the blood of your children that you gave to them. Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you from every side and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all your nakedness. And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged and bring upon you the blood of and wrath, the blood of wrath and jealousy. And I will give you into the hands and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. They shall strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. They shall bring up a crowd against you, and they shall stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords. And 
He shall burn your houses and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women. I will make you stop playing the whore, and you shall also give payment no more. One more verse, 42. So will I satisfy my wrath on you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be calm and will no more be angry. All right, in this symbolic story, what's going to happen to this wife who's a prostitute? She's going to be. Be I like this oh. translation. Therefore, you whore. <laughs> and that's probably pretty accurate. I mean, he's the Lord's man. The Lord's I, upset. I, I, These are strong I, words I, I, against him. Oh, Jill's on the phone. Let me uh, let me recast this so we can get them in here. There we go. All right. All right, come on. Let me end up here. Uh, come on. Uh, all right. Sorry, guys. Let's try that. There we go. That's better. All right. Um, in this symbolic story, what's going to happen to the woman? The prostitute? So I should go shield. That's eventually going to be it because... In, in... It's going to be a public display of all her... Yeah. Of everything that she's done wrong. And everyone that she had an affair with or whatever is going to turn against her, whether she loved them Bingo. or hated them. They are all going to turn against her. Her The ones that are going to bring punishment on her are those very ones that she turned to. They're going to turn against her. So transfer that over into the spiritual and out of the allegory. What's going to happen to the Jews? What's going to happen to Judah? Those Who's going to oppress her? are going to turn against them and conquer them. These nations that they turned to and gave tribute to and began worshiping their idols and thought that they could help them, Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, are all going to be the ones that bring her downfall. There is a word of hope here. There's a word of, this is heavy law, isn't it? About as heavy as law gets. However, there is one word of hope. Verse 42. It'll be common, be no longer anger. Then I will lay to rest my wrath against you. My jealousy will turn away from you and I will be calm and no longer angry. So the end result of all this is they're going to go into exile. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. Yet, what will happen? God will still be done. He'll forgive them. Yeah. And they'll return. Questions or comments? When you look at it, it's a pretty good allegory, isn't it? Works, works very well back then, but even today. Is that applicable for us? We get it. Uh, let's read now verses 43 to 52. Because you have not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me with all these things, therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord. Have you not committed lewdness in addition to all your abominations? Behold, Everyone who uses Proverbs will use this proverb about you. Like mother, like daughter. You are the daughter of your mother who loathed her husband and her children. And you are the sister of your sisters who loathed their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. And your sister a Samaritan who lived in with her daughters to the north of you and your younger sister who lived in the south of you. Is Sodom with her daughters? 
not only did you walk in their ways and do according to their abominations within a very little time, you were more corrupt than they in all your ways. As I live, declares the Lord God, your sister Sodom and her daughters have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did not an abomination before me. So I removed them when I saw. Samaria was not has not committed half your sins. You have committed more abominations than they and have made your sisters appear righteous by all the abominations that you have committed. Bear your disgrace, you also, for you have intervened on behalf of your sisters. Because of your sins in which you acted more abominably than they, they are more in the right than you. So be ashamed, so you also, and bear your disgrace, for you have made your sisters appear only. Oh, wow. I hit the wrong button. Righteous. Wow. That, where was it? So pretty okay. strong words, huh? Yeah. Pretty strong words. Days of your youth, verse 43. What is that talking about? You did not remember the days of your youth. The early years when they came into Canaan or when they were in Egypt and they were a solid nation and separate from the idolatry, the, the younger nation. For they, the, uh, when the Lord saved them out of Egypt, Mount Sinai, giving them the land, prospering the land, maybe especially the days of King David and King yeah. Solomon. Yeah. When they were faithful and the Lord was blessing them. Pastor, was I, was I catching that right? It sounds like parents talking about kids. Well, he never was going to amount to anything anyway, and we knew that neighbor kid was just a bum, but yeah, we had low expectations for him. But you, you have fallen so far, and it's like it's like God, God had put them higher, and so they had further to fall than the people around them. Verse 46, your older sister is Samaria. Who is Samaria? No, the northern king is the neighbor. Yeah. Israel. The ten tribes to the north. And what we know about them, were they ever faithful to the Lord? Only the first uh, steal away. Never. Never returned to the Lord. They worshipped idol after idol after idol. And that's why Assyria came and destroyed them. I don't know, I got a, kind of a giggle. It's just like it, when they talked about like mother, like daughter, and I think, yeah, you said that to my mother and my daughter about her daughter. I expected more from you. <laughs> mother, I think. That's a bad enough, reminding them that, you know, you're related to them, and you're acting like them. Even worse, your younger sister is sad. What do we know about Sodom and Gomorrah? Keep your finger here. They were, they were destroyed. Let's turn to uh, Genesis 19. Read verses 24 to 25. Ready? Yep. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire out of the sky from the Lord. He overthrew those cities as well as all the palm, the plain, and the inhabitants of the city, and whatever grew in the soil. But Lot Why did he do all that? That's smart enough. Pardon me. That was good enough. Why did he do all that? Because they were evil. And how were they evil? They were, they were having a lot of sex. I know that. They tried to they tried to have sex with the angels that came to war. That's right. Yeah. I mean, they knocked on the it's door and he sat earth. him away and he said, Here, take my daughter, but don't take these men. Yep. No. So evil they wanted to rape these men that came to this. Evil enough that the Lord destroyed them, destroyed the whole town. 
he kept warning them, but they, they wouldn't feed him. It's one faithful family. Save a lot out of it. Yep. And Sarah didn't listen. She turned around, turned to a pillar stone. Yep. Let's look at uh, some area. Uh, 2 Kings 17, 5 through 18. Somebody wants to read that? What was the passage you meant? Second Kings 17, 5 through 8. I'll read it. I'll give you guys three. There's three more for you guys to read. Then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land, and he went up against Samaria and sieged it for three years. At Hosea's ninth year, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and exiled Israel to Assyria. He made them live in Hala along the Habor River, which is the river of, river of Gozan, in the cities of the Medes. This happened because the people of Israel sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they feared other gods. And they walked in the practices of other nations whom the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel and the practices which the kings of Israel had introduced. The people of Israel did, th did secret things against the Lord, which were not right. They also built high places for themselves in all the cities and from watchtower to fortified city. They set up sacred memorial stones and Asherah poles for themselves up on every high hill and under every leafy tree. And they offered sacrifices at all the high places, like the nations that God drove out before them. They did evil things, provoking the Lord to anger. They served filthy idols. Filthy idols. Once again, remember we encountered this word before, filthy? We're talking about like dumb, crap, excrement. Filthy idols, even though the Lord had said to them, you must not do this. The Lord had warned Israel and Judah through all of his prophets and seers, saying, turn back from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my regulations according to the entire law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servant, the prophets. But they did not listen. They made their necks just as stiff as their fathers who did not trust the Lord their God. They rejected his regulations and his covenant, which he made with their fathers, and the testimony with which he warned them. They followed useless idols, and they became useless themselves. They followed the other nations around them, about whom the Lord had commanded them, do not do as they do. They deserted all the commands of the Lord their God, and they made themselves with images to place. They made a shear of poles, and they bowed down to the whole army of heaven, and they served the Baals. They made their sons and daughters pass through fire. They engaged in divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So the Lord was furious with Israel and he removed them from his presence. None was left, only the tribe of Judah. Your sister, Samaria, your other sister was, uh, uh, was Sodom. Not good things to hear, is it? You're like that, the Lord says. And he's going to go on to say even more than that. Pastor, I have a question. I, if you have that explanation thing that they made a share of polls, I don't understand what, what that practice was. A share of polls. Did the commentary say something about what is that? A share was the consort of Baal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Baal was the rain god. Sure. But if you wanted to make Baal rain, you had to get his consort with him because when Baal and Asher got it on, it rained. Oh, you mentioned that last week. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So Asher, but they said Asher of poles. I thought they were some kind of. That's how they worship it. Yeah. I don't know what the poles looked like, but that was uh, Baal was an idol, and there were poles for the idol for Asher. Yeah. So you worship both of them. I think a share also, you know, and, and, and depending on what nation it was, the practice has changed a little bit. But I believe a share was, uh, she was fertility God in that if uh, women to have children, she opened the womb, you worshiped her, she opened the womb. So, good question. We get a spelling on that. A share of holes. It's H. I lost it. 
I don't see it on here. Right. I'm back in Ezekiel. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Verse 16. Okay. Um, verse 47. Keeping in mind how evil Samaria and, and uh, Sodom were. You did not merely walk in their ways, act according to their abominations, since in a very short time you became more depraved. You were worse than them. As bad as we know Sodom to be, the Lord saying, you, my people, who I planted and I gave you all of these things, you were worse than them. So much so Samaria did not sin half as much as you did. Remember all the stuff I read? You multiplied your abominations more than they did. In fact, so much you made these two evil nations look righteous. They looked like they were in right standing with God compared to what you did. You acted more repulsively than they did. That's saying a lot. Questions or comments? Let's continue on and read. Uh, we're back in Ezekiel 16, verses 53 to 58. I will restore their fortunes, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters, and I will restore your own fortunes in their midst, that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, and you and your daughters shall return to your former state. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in your mouth in the day of your pride before your wickedness was uncovered? Now you have become an object of reproach for the daughters of Syria and all those around her and for the daughters of the Philistines, those all around who despise you. You bear the penalty of your lewdness and your abominations, declares the Lord. That's good. Right there. Very good. What do we have in verse 53? Law or gospel? Gospel. Gospel. He's going to restore who? All of her sisters. Even Sodom her. and Samaria. As evil as they were, he will restore them. As well as the daughter of you. How is he going to do that? What's what does he say is going to happen in verse 54? Well, you will be ashamed of everything. Bear your disgrace, be ashamed of everything you did. Are they ashamed of what they're doing now? No. What does it mean to bear your uh, uh bear your disgrace and be ashamed? What do we call that? That's part of what? Mm -hmm. It's confession, right? Admitting your sins. I'm a poor, miserable sinner. They're basically asking for forgiveness. They'll turn to get them to turn and ask for forgiveness. Yes. So why is the Lord laying this heavy law and saying all these evil things? What's the end result? Yes. Yes. Return. Repent. So that some may be saved. Sodom will return to her former state, Samaria, her former state, and your daughters, uh, you and your daughters will return to your former state. I'll restore you. Questions or comments? Uh, 
quite the forgiveness. It was an amazing grace, right? After reading all of the abominations of Samaria and of what we know of Sodom, and then saying that, that, that Judah was even worse. Amazing grace. Beyond what I think I would do if I was God. All right. Uh, 59 to 63. We'll finish the chapter off. So this is what the Lord God says. Shall I do with you just as you have done? You have de despised your oath, therefore breaking the covenant? No, just the opposite. I myself will remember my covenant I made with you during the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant for you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed. When you receive your sisters who are older than you, in addition to those who are younger than you, and I will give them to you as daughters and not outside of your covenant. I myself will establish my covenant with you. Then you will know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of disgrace. But I make atonement for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord your God. Good. Lord says, shall I do with you as you have done? Meaning what? Should I respond like you? Turn away from you. They turned away from the Lord. So the Lord said, shall I turn away from you? Completely. He would be just and right to do that. Except Verse 60, how is he different from them? I'll remember my covenant. I made a deal. I made an agreement. No. You're not living up to your end of it. But I do. I'll remember. I'm faithful to it. I'm faithful to the promises that I made you. And not only that, I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Broke the old one. So remember, uh, some uh, Protestant churches and Reformed churches, they will promise to Israel, God promised to always give that land to them, and he's eventually going to restore it. They broke that covenant, that agreement that this land will always be yours, because they no longer worship him as Lord. Jews think they do, but they don't recognize the triune God. That land is no longer given to them. They get to live there now, and that's an example of God's grace. But anybody that says the land of Israel, as we used to know it, is going to be restored before Christ returns. Nope. Um, so what is this everlasting covenant? Keep your finger here in Ezekiel. And let's turn to Jeremiah. These will be some very familiar verses to you. It's Jeremiah 31. 31 to 34. Yes, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them from the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant of mine. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will each one teach his neighbor or each one teach his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, or I will forgive their guilt. And I will remember their sins. Familiar passage to you? Yeah. Why is this important not only to them as a promise, but to us today? Because we know that God won't hold our sins against us. Has the Lord put his law in your mind? Yeah. How? Well, through baptism, when he says, in your heart, both on the forehead and upon the chest, on our heart, when you make the sign of the cross, he is 
Through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yep. He applies that law that we read to our hearts. And baptism, very good. You nailed it, Al. He became our God and we became his precious child. And through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, we begin to know the Lord. And that's our life lived under the cross. It's a continual growth in knowing the Lord. But we know the most important thing about him and believe in it, and that is the Lord is such a loving God that he sent his only son who went to the cross to die for our sins and therefore restore us as God's precious forgiven children. Well, the last sentence, and I will remember their sins no more. At times being a, a in my sad parenting moments, I would go back and what did we do to our kids? We'd say, I remember back when you did that. But who's still right here? Nah, I don't remember those anymore. Those sins of the past, you who live in a repentant relationship with the Lord, he does not recall them or remember them. You might, but you don't need to. You can send them away because he does not remember them. When we first started reading it, and it talked about they broke the covenant with him about Israel. So that's, again, reiterating the fact that they no longer they claimed to Israel because they broke that covenant. All of it was foreshadowing against a better land. And, and what promised land do we look forward to? I'm sorry. Eternal life. That's the promise. Land. So that promise is still there for the covenant from God, but it's not a temporal, not in this world. You don't want any land in this world because it's all broken and fallen and full of sin and polluted. And we want the perfect land to come, the restoration of perfection, the restoration of the Garden of Eden, eternal life. One more to look up, uh, New Testament, Romans 11, 25 through 27. For I do not want you to be uninformed about this mystery, brothers, so that you are not conceited in your opinion of yourself. There has been a hardening of, of heart of Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Who is this deliverer? Christ. Out of Zion, from among God's chosen people. How did he remove ungodliness from Jacob? He died on the cross for their sins. Yeah. Moved it by taking it away, dying for them, forgiving them, being the atoning sacrifice. That's the covenant we have. That's the covenant that is in the Lord's Supper, right? Mm-hmm. Just for the Jews? No, for just for those Jews. people that were that are no, it's just Gentiles. Yep. For all people. And that happened when? Pentecost. Pentecost began the reaching out to the Gentiles to call them in and through that same faith, because remember it's not about actually being blood related to Abraham, to being a blood Jew. It's the faith of Abraham, and that was given through the gospel message sent out to all the Gentiles. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So how is Paul defining Israel here? Jew and Gentile, according to the faith of Abraham. That's all Israel. Welcome, Israel. You are Israel, and I am Israel. You are God's chosen. I'm God's chosen. All of those Jews who believe in Jesus are God's chosen. Muslims who turn to faith in Jesus, God's chosen. Pretty amazing thing. Turning back to Ezekiel. Actually, I'll just do this. There we go. Uh, Verse 63, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your disgrace. 
when I make atonement for you for all you have done. The atonement is in Christ. So that we, even though we remember we were sinful and we could, we admit that on a Sunday morning, we're poor, miserable sinners, we don't need to be ashamed because it's forgiven. Because atonement has been made for us. It also describes learning a certain lesson. What would we call that lesson? What is the lesson God taught the Jews through all this? Remain faithful. Remain faithful. Don't worship idols. Humility. That was another lesson, humility. Good. With that, let's turn to our study guide. Finally. Day four. Question 15, in Ezekiel 16, 2 to 4, well, really it's 2 to 14. God describes his initial love for Jerusalem. What blessings for his people are implied by this image? It's that beginning an image of, Jews, of, of Ezekiel 16. And what was it? What was this allegory? How did it start out? Who did he describe Israel to be? Land of milk and honey. Land of milk and honey, but who was Israel? They were, was that the bride? Yeah, but before they became the bride, they were cast off in the wilderness, the baby in the wilderness. Cast off, unloved, born, but not washed off. The umbilical cord not even cut. And the Lord came along and did what? Washed them, covered them, gave them everything. And how did we say that that reflected on, uh, in, in, a, in a real historical sense, what did the Lord do for this nation? Forgave them. For, show them love? How did he show them love? How were they like a cast off baby that nobody wanted? He gave, he, he gave them the land of milk and honey. Yes. He, they were slaves in Egypt. He rescued them. He made them his own. Threw his blanket over them. At Sinai. When he said, I am, I am your God and you will be my people. And you're my chosen people. Your right faith gave them the land of milk and honey. Took them that weren't a people and made them a people and blessed them beyond belief. More than they deserve. Question 16 is Ecclesiastes 2, 10 to 11 and 5, 10 to 12. So let's turn there. Ecclesiastes. Bonus question. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? We don't know. Someone? Yes. You can Solomon know. is looking back at the end of his life. He tells him. And he's writing some words of wisdom from that point of view. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, Ecclesiastes uh, 10 to 11. Somebody want to read that? And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not withhold from them. What is Solomon saying about what he did and what his life was like at that point? Whatever he wanted. <laughs> Whatever he wanted. He took it. Wealth, women, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> Life of indulgence. Does that ring a bell in our culture today? Is that not our society? 
All about me. <laughs> All about me, immediate gratification. And unlike any other time before we have the means, you can go on the internet, find whatever you want. You want porn, you want sex, it's there on the internet. If you want to buy whatever you want, Amazon is there. Amazon's a great tool. I mean, I love it. But it increases what, what Norma said, that idea of it's all about me gathering unto myself. If I'm depressed, I'll go buy something. Instant gratification. Yes. And how does and Solomon experience this back in his day and being one of the wisest men? What does he say about it? It was all just trans vape, all chasing the wind. What happens when you try to chase the wind? Are you going to catch it? No. no. There was no benefit under the sun. And not only from the self indulgence, but also when I turned my attention to everything my hands had done. What does that mean in our day? When you turn your attention to all your hands are done, what are you looking at? So. I worked hard mm -hmm. for me. My house, I deserve my it. car, my yacht, my job, my tool, my clothes, man, men, right? Did Solomon not have all of that? Mm -hmm. And what does he say it was in the end? Favor. Doesn't last. So the happiness you gain, what's that, Norma? It's like you can't take it with you. Yeah, because you can't take it with you. Yeah. And even when you're here, when you look at people that can they can have the kind of money they can buy anything, are they happy? No. No, not really, because they're always worried it's going to be taken from them and they're they don't have they're worried that any friend they have is not a true friend, they're just a friend because of what they can get out. Yeah. Tom, did you have something? Oh, I was going to just share this. Sharon and I, we like to watch HGTV. And one of the things that we hear a lot is they go to look at three houses. Oh, this is a nice house. This is a nice house. But this looks like I really made it. I want something that makes me look like I really made it. I'm thinking. That's if, if, if that is the epitome of self. Tom, on Sunday, when you wore that suit, that suit was you. <laughs> that was you. Suit maybe he had on somewhere. I think Al's, Al's using an allegory here, a metaphor. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ecclesiastes 10, 5, versus uh, 10 to 12, they're on the screen, or you can look them up, whichever. So you want to read verses 10 through uh, 12. Anyone who loves money is never satisfied with money, and anyone who loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is vanishing vapor. When goods increase, so do those who eat them. What profit then does the owner get except to see these things with his eyes? The worker's sleep is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But a rich person's abundant possessions allow him no sleep. And you worry you're going to lose it. Yep. Isn't that true? The more money you get, the more it costs to keep it. Well, the bigger your desire to buy things. People in the music industry, I haven't had a hit in three years. I've got to come up with something. I've got to, I've got to come up with a better song. I've got to reach that next level. The more money you have, don't you have to hire people to manage it? I don't have to worry. Just help you with taxes? What? I don't have to worry. Well, yeah. You don't have people, bro? You don't have no. Yeah. So there, there is a blessing. I mean, and that's part of this one. The worker's sleep is sweet. And why would the rich man's sleep not be sweet? Maybe that's why I sleep so well. <laughs> He's worried, he's worried somebody will take his money. It's in any faith. Worried about somebody taking it. Worried about making more. There's always that. There's never enough. You always want more. You always want more. 
And what I've done really helps Juan and Wesley. Yeah, it's like, it's like, oh, who's going to see on my car? It's going to be there when I walk out. So in question 16, it says, describe problems like those confronted by Ezekiel. Wasn't, wasn't that one of the downfalls of uh, of Jews, of, of uh, Judah? He had blessed them abundantly, but it was never enough. They wanted more. And when the Lord didn't give it to them, they looked to other nations and other idols. Why is it so easy for fame, fortune, and privilege to lead a person into depravity and self-destruction? Because they think they have it all, they don't need anybody else, don't need God. Can you ever satisfy the desires of your sinful nature? No. Or, or, no. We're almost there. Uh, Ezekiel 16, 35 to 63. Which we're not going to call that. <laughs> this is the Lord talking about what he's going to do to them. Because of all that she's done to expose her nakedness, her lovers are going to see it. And they're going to be the ones that punish her. They're going to be the methods of punishment. In what ways would faithless Jerusalem be stripped bare before all the other surrounding nations? All these other nations are going to watch them. Turn up against them. Turn against them and they're going to see. They're going to see the Jews lose everything. Little bit by bit. They're not God's chosen people at this point because they have paid attention. They're always God's chosen, but he's disciplining them. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to see the kingdom broken down bit by bit. And this happened over a period of years. They remained unfaithful. He allowed other nations to come in and take over and take chunks of it. And then finally, what we've been studying all along, they're going to see Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed. That's, that's their nakedness made bare. And they're going to say, this is unbelievable. Look at what's happened in this country. And they're also going to comment, those people are more depraved than we are. <laughs> they used to say we were bad and not following what their Lord says. And look at them. They're worse than we are. You know, it, it's like this country is right now. And then they talk about, you know, how we're always talking about sex trafficking and child, and child slavery and stuff. And this is the worst country in the world for it. And interestingly enough, this country the thing is hot. It's, it's, yep. it's a little louder, Tom. A little louder. Michigan is within the top, at least the top 10 is just sex crap. Yep. So, you know, we, we talk about other people being bad, and we're just as bad. I think we're kind of like Israel. Remember, as part of Ezekiel, God's going to remember his covenant. Yep. He's going to remember that's said a couple different times. Let's see if we can get through this challenge question. There's a bunch of verses there. I'm going to put them on the screen rather than have you guys look them up. But the first one is uh, Genesis 8, 1. And let's look at what happened when God remembers. Genesis 8, 1. And remember Noah as well as all the animals and all the livestock and were with him in the ark, so God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and water subsided. What happened when God remembered Noah and everybody in the ark? They were saved. They were so saved. He brought the flood to an end. Now keep in mind, God never forgot. Remember it is something to help us as human beings to understand. God always remembers. But what he remembered at the perfect time and place, he saves he forgives, he restores. Uh, Nehemiah 13, 14. 
Remember me, O God, because of this, and do not wipe away my faithful deeds, which I have done for the sake of the house of my God and for the sake of its services. What else does God remember? Faithful Do we sometimes suffer even when we haven't? Things we haven't sinned about? The bad things happen? Bad things happen to good people, right? Keeping in mind, we're all sinful, broken people, but sometimes you're just cruising along and you're being faithful and diagnosis of cancer. Lose your job. Lose a love. But we know this, he remembers. He remembers our faithfulness. Even when we might think he's forgotten. God remembers faithfulness. Exodus 2. Twenty-four. So God heard the heard their groaning, and He remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. It's in reference to Israel being enslaved in Egypt, God remembered. He had not forgot that He had promised them that He would be His people, and He would give them the promised land. He hears when we cry out and we groan. He hears. And he remembers, and what does he remember in case of us? What would he be remembering? What covenant is it? A baptismal covenant. Christ is our Savior. We are forgiven. He made us his people. He never forgets that. He remembers that. Psalm 115.12. The Lord remembers us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. When he remembers us, he does what? He blesses bless. us. Yes. It may not seem like a blessing sometimes, but it's there. Yep. All things work for the good, right? Those who love God, even things we don't consider to be blessings, actually really, in a way we can't tell, especially at the time, are. And there are certainly all of those things that are blessings in our life that we forget about. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 10. This is what the Lord says concerning this people. They love to wander. They never restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. Instead, he will remember their guilt and punish their sins. So he's kind of remembering here, isn't it? He remembers the bad if they don't accept him. Okay. If you don't turn in repentance, if you reject the free gift of the gospel, what will he remember on Judgment Day? Every Your sins. Every sin that you refuse to be covered by God's grace. But I, I could see how some people would misinterpret that because it says and they will punish your sins. So like somebody like Joel Olsen can get up there and say, hey, he's punishing you. Like they used to say about eight, he's punishing you because you're gay. It's punishing you. Well, the only reason you'll be punished is because you refuse the free gift of grace. Exactly. That's the big, big thing on the last day when you stand before him. What did you do with Christ? Everyone who hears the gospel, which is basically the gospels went out through the whole world. Everybody's received this gift. It's yours. It's in your lap. You choose to deny it. Choose to say, I don't need it. I'm righteous on my own. I don't believe in God, whatever. On the last day, all, all of it. And the, 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 the really bad part is Christ has covered it. He suffered that already. That Everybody, everybody sins on the cross. But if you choose evil, if you choose unbelief, you will have to suffer that and you'll suffer it for eternity. However, let's move on a little bit in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 34. No longer will each one teach his neighbor, or each one teach his brother, saying, I know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord, for I will forgive their guilt 
and I will remember their sins no more. Christ died for all, and he gives this gift in the gospel. Forgiveness of their sin, forgiveness of their guilt. Remember their sins no more. Separate them as far as east is from west. That's true of you and me. It's true of every single person that comes to faith. There's not a person whose sins have not been taken by Christ to the cross. I was talking with somebody earlier, and we happened to mention, uh, when you think about that, that, that God forgives people that you and I would never forgive. Charles Manson. Before he died, if he turned to faith in Christ, every evil thing that he did and said would have been forgiven. Yeah, look. If he turned to faith in Christ before he died, every single evil thing he did would have been forgiven. Think of the person that's done you the most evil and wrong in your life and still hates you to this day. If they turn to Christ, they're forgiven. He remembers their sin no more. On behalf of Christ, that's what he remembers out of you. What a great place to leave it, right? After all this heavy law, he remembers your sins no more. Let's try to sneak in uh, question 19 and we can put day four to bed. Samaria and Sodom were Jerusalem's sisters who were already punished for their sins before Jerusalem. When God promised to restore them under the new covenant of Jerusalem's daughters, what did it mean for their mission for the future church? keeping in mind that uh, Sodom really wasn't technically a sister of Judah or of Israel. And we're asked to see Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This, this is how I said, this is Jesus. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. He's talking to his disciples that are all gathering around. Shoot. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the earth, ends of the earth. Our Samaria, keep in mind all the, the northern kingdom, they're the lost tribes. So they became effectively Gentiles because they were taken away and they intermarried with the Assyrians and everybody else that Assyria had conquered. So what is Jesus talking about is going to happen here? He's foreshadowing Pentecost, which is when what happened? They received the Holy Spirit, and it, they became able to speak in different languages to witness to the different people. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Then in all Judea, and then in Samaria, you get this idea of it stretching out from Jerusalem. You have Judah. You have Samaria and the ends of the earth. Is that still happening now? Yes. It's still going, and that's the message of the church. And that's what's being predicted here in Ezekiel, and it's still being fulfilled now. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. All righty. Final questions and comments. Pretty heavy law in there, but uh, God includes his message of grace, does he not? Interesting. Interesting chapter that we made it through. Yeah. Tune in next week. <laughs> I just found a letter that came on our mail, and I'm going to pass it off to you. Okay. Uh, do we want to do this as part of our study or after? After. Okay. Because then it won't be recorded. I'm not sure if we want it to be recorded. So any other final questions or comments that you didn't have a chance to make? Jill, how's that pad doing at your house? How's that pad of questions? Oh, I'm trying, oh, I'm to, trying to figure this figure all out. out. Figure out what we've been studying or figure out uh, something else? Well, I got my timeline out, so I got to put my questions in down on paper so I know what I'm thinking. We're going to kind of review the same thing again. Ezekiel just keeps impressing upon him, and that's because you've got the Jews both in Jerusalem at this time, 
It hasn't been destroyed yet. And in exile, they keep hoping that Babylon's going to go away and they've got their perimeter, their prophetic voices that are saying, no, everything's going to be fine and God will never destroy the temple. And by the way, the exiles, you'll be sent home. We aren't going to be here a long time. And the Lord's instructing upon them, yes, you will. And now here's the reason why. Here's the reason why this punishment is so great. It's because you have been so sinful. And I've called out to you time and again. So uh, we're going to have a new uh, analogy. We looked at uh, Jerusalem as being the prostitute, the loving wife who was made a queen and turned into a prostitute. Now we're going to look at it uh, in verse 17 from a different point of view. I just think it's that we're studying a lot of verse really. If you're just reading it through, you just don't no. get a quarter of it. I mean, this means so much more. Go through it like this. Good. I'm trying not to make it difficult or I'm trying not to lose you amidst the weeds, but it does help. It really does help. Anything else? Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, in the midst of all of these words of heavy law, you words of grace are so welcome. Help us to hang on to that. You allow difficult things to come into our life, and sometimes it is the consequence of our sin, but other times it just happens because we live in a fallen, broken world. But all of it, all of it has this aim that we would turn to you in repentance and stay and hold fast to you in faith that we would always look to you for our answers, first and foremost, and that any means in the world that come about to be relief and help are all from your hand, because you are our loving and gracious God, and you were made us your children through Jesus Christ. And we always look and wonder at the love that he showed us when he went to the cross and died and rose again. May that wonder always inspire us to worship and praise you and to share the gospel message with others. All this we ask and pray in our Lord and Savior Jesus' name and all people respond. Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody. I will see you next week. We're going to continue on with this Bible study throughout Lent. I'm going to give it a try. Uh, tonight will be the last uh, Bible study for the chosen until after Easter. So we'll come for the final episode. But this one will confirm. I hope. God's grace. Wait. I got a question. Yes, sir. Are you going to be there about one o'clock? <laughs> Cindy and I are setting up for the transfiguration, and then um, I got to set up for Ash Wednesday. So we have questions on banners and stuff. Ruby, I'll see you then. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we break and stop recording? Anybody else have a question that needs to be part of class? Otherwise, I'm going to end it. And we'll talk about every, whatever we need to otherwise. Reverend Art, thanks for joining us. I hope it lifted up your spirit. And may we see you tonight. Yeah, I kept losing it. I had to reboot and had to shut everything down. And I kept losing it. And I kept coming back and coming back. I don't know what's wrong with this computer. Or the, I don't know either, but it's, it's, it's with your computer, but I'm glad you're able to come back. At yeah. Spectrum, I, I, I had to shut it off and come back completely about three different times. Maybe you might need to reboot your computer. Maybe I, did. Glad. I did reboot it. Okay. I don't right, know maybe, what it is. Maybe we can find an answer for it. We'll see you later tonight, brother. Yeah.